Did you know that children as young as six years old already feel insecure with their body and want to diet or do something to change how they look? Doesn't that break your heart? Six years old, they should be running around, jumping in puddles, not worrying about how their legs look. This happens because we live in a society that is so set on diet culture and fitting in and looking a certain way. And there are five things that you do as a parent that fosters this negative relationship. So today we're gonna to talk about what those five things are that you do that end up ruining your child's relationship with food in their body and how you can stop that. And I wanted to say a disclaimer to start off. Everything that you do as a parent is done with love and I know that and I've been there. You're not doing these five things intentionally to harm your child. It's just how you were raised, it's what you were taught, it's all you know, and you think it's helping, and you think it's helping make a positive, healthy relationship for your child, but in the end, it's actually doing the opposite. So hi, my name is Nikki. Welcome back to the Nutrition Spot. We're on this channel, we chat all things, getting away from diet culture, getting food freedom, and stop living the stress that diets put on your life, and also how to raise a family that is an intuitive eater, your kids, so that they can eat intuitively so they never feel like they need to diet. I'm a mom of two kids, so I know how easy it is to say these things because we think it's helping them. So remember that while I go through them, I know you're not doing these things to cause harm, but just note that you can start making a change now you can stop doing these five things so that you can foster a healthy relationship with food in your body for your kids so that they can grow up and never feel the need to diet. Oh my God, how amazing would that be? How amazing would your life have been if you didn't have the stress and anxiety of dieting for a lot of your adult years? So let's just dive in. So the first thing you wanna stop doing is saying this to your kids. Those are good foods. Those are bad foods. I know you're probably thinking, what, Nikki? Well, how are they gonna learn what's healthy and what's unhealthy? It's not your child's role to know what's healthy or unhealthy or good or bad, even though that's a horrible terminology. As the parent, it's your role to offer a variety of foods to your kids, and their role is to eat what feels good for them and an amount that feels good for them. They don't need to know what's healthy or unhealthy. They don't have the brain power to make those decisions. Think back to when you were 10 years old and your mom gave you $5 to go to the, the corner store to buy something. In your head, are you going, okay, apples are healthy, Slurpees or shakes or ice cream is, is not healthy. I should probably choose an apple. No way, you were like, I got five bucks, I'm going to get all the things that taste good and I love. Because that's all you care about at that age. And into your teen years, it's not until you're in your 20s that you have the brain capacity and the knowledge to think, okay, I should critically think about my food choices. Before that age, you are going for gratification. That's all you're going for. So when we say this is a bad food, Kids take it literally and they think if I eat whatever it is my mom said was bad, let's say a cookie, that must make me a bad person. And this is where guilt starts with eating. Have you ever eaten something and felt guilty about it? This is why, because children take it literally. Bad food means I'm a bad person for eating it. So instead of using that terminology, don't even talk about health and nutrition with your kids. I know you might think that that sounds crazy, but just show them what a healthy relationship with food is by eating a variety of foods, having all the foods available, but eating in them in a way that feels good. So at meals, offering a balance, having treat foods often, you know, showing that you can have all the foods and be a healthy person because you're not restricting or making yourself eat certain foods or not allowing yourself to eat certain foods. It's all about modeling that healthy behavior with food and your kids will see that. We don't need to use words. And on a side note, I know that they learn this stuff in school and it drives me bonkers because 
again, it's the wrong messaging. It's okay to talk to them about fiber and nutrients, but they shouldn't be feeling demonized for wanting to eat a cookie over wanting to eat an apple because that's normal human behavior. Number two, making them eat everything that's on their plate. You know, the clean the plate club. You can't leave the table until you've eaten two more bites of broccoli or three more bites of chicken or everything that's on your plate. Now, the reason being is because this gets them out of touch with their fullness. Maybe they were full. Maybe they have eaten enough during the day that they didn't need to eat very much at that meal. They were just full. So now when we encourage them and push them to keep eating, they're moving away from learning how to trust their body and to understand their fullness. Again, think about you at meal times. Do you automatically finish everything on your plate without realizing how full you are, and then moments after supper or half an hour after supper, you feel stuffed and uncomfortable? Do you have a hard time stopping mid-meal even though you know that you're done because you maybe feel some guilt that you need to eat everything because there's starving children in other countries and so if you don't eat the food on your plate, you're a bad person? This is again from our parents telling us to keep eating even when we're full. And I know the biggest resistance that I get is, well, Nikki, what if, they will, what if they just don't eat very well and they only want a snack and then they never want to eat their veggies? I understand that that's a concern for you and most parents, but we need to trust our kids. And if they are snackers and they're not eating supper, that's a different issue with how often you're providing food and allowing them to snack, which we can talk about in a different video. But for the sake of this video, at meal times, when you make them eat past their fullness, you're getting them out of touch with their fullness. They're not gonna know how to stop eating. And then they're going to go on a cycle of overeating in their life and then feeling the need to diet because they can't control themselves around food. So number three goes along with number two. And that is saying that they can't have dessert until they finish what's on their plate or until they have two more bites of broccoli, or again, three more bites of chicken, setting boundaries around when they can have dessert. This is harmful to our kids because it teaches them a couple different things. One of them being dessert is up on a pedestal. It is more desirable than supper because I have to eat these foods that I don't really like to be able to eat that dessert. So again, as adults, this is why dessert becomes so desirable and we always want it and we'll eat it even if we're full because we've been taught that we have to fill up on food before we can even start eating that dessert food. So we will eat it even if we are stuffed. Even if we've just eaten you know, a turkey dinner at Christmas, we will still have a slice of pie because that's just what we do because we had to finish what was on our plate before we deserved to eat that food. So again, building on the fullness, now we're also teaching them that eat past your fullness. Eat past your fullness till you eat dessert. You know, don't listen to your body when it's full and, and, eat, and save the dessert for later or maybe have a little bit less supper because this is a really desirable dessert that you love. You're pushing them past their fullness, out of touch with their body. Now again, I know the big hands up is, well, Nikki, if, they, if I don't force them to eat, then they're not going to eat their supper, and then they're only going to be eating sugar. And that might happen at first, because they've already kind of been conditioned to wanting that dessert more than supper. But one thing you can do is start serving dessert with your meal so that it's even. There's no increased desirability, and they can eat it at any point during their meal. Again, the first couple times you do this, they might eat the dessert first, but I promise you, the more and more you do it, they will maybe take a bite of dessert, take a bite of broccoli, take some bites of chicken, go back to the dessert. They'll move around the plate and they're not just gonna be hyper-focused on the dessert, just like they were before. What also happens is there becomes an association with eating food and then needing sweets right after. You know, like that feeling you get when you finish supper even though you're full and you're like, I still just want something sweet. This happens when we're forced to eat supper before we can get dessert. If you serve dessert with the meal, then you lose that. 
And it doesn't have to be every day. It's whenever you decide to serve dessert, do it this way. Whether it's lunch, whether it's snack, whether it's supper, it doesn't matter. Keep it neutral, keep it equal with the other foods so that it doesn't become this super desirable thing that they have to force themselves to eat other food and feel full before they can have. The fourth thing is portion controlling their sweets for them. We just had Easter, so you know, they get their Easter candy and then saying, okay, you can have four Easter eggs today. Again, I know we during this because we don't want them to overeat sugar, but what we're actually doing is showing them that they can't be trusted with their food. That we have to portion it out because we can't trust them with sugar. And really, with kids, Sometimes they're going to eat a lot, but sometimes they're going to eat a little. Sometimes they'll sit down and eat 20 Easter eggs and another time they'll have one and be like, I'm over it or have a half a bite of one or something, you know? We need to give them the trust that they can listen to their bodies. Even when in moments they might eat more sugar than we feel comfortable with, even if they eat to a point where they get a stomach ache because it's exciting, they learn from that and they need to experience those times to be able to know how much body or how much to be able to know how much sugar they can eat and what feels good if we don't give them that opportunity they're never going to learn it and if we portion their sugar all the time it makes it more desirable because what if that time that you portioned it was a time that they wanted seven easter eggs and now they want more but you won't let them have it so it makes it more desirable and more exciting because you never portion control their broccoli. You never say you're only allowed to eat four pieces of broccoli. So something must be super special about this food and I want it more. So again, giving your kids control. Our role as adults is to decide when we offer foods and what foods we offer and our kids decide how much they have. You can decide when you're offering the sweets, but if you're going to offer sweets, let them let them go at it. Let them have full reign. And again, at first, if you haven't been doing this, they might go sugar crazy because they're testing the boundaries. They're not sure that this is going to last forever, but the more and more you do it, the more they will be able to control it. Again, if you were a kid who parents did this for the most part, let's say with your Halloween candy and your Halloween candy would sit in your closet or your hiding spot from your other siblings or wherever you kept it, and you would forget about it, and all of a sudden like Christmas would come around, you'd open that drawer and you'd be like, oh, I still have candy from Halloween. It goes to show that this is possible. Kids don't just always want to eat sugar. They're only like that because of these things that we're doing that are making the sugar more desirable and making them want it more. If it's equal, it's not as much more desirable. And the fifth and last thing that you can stop doing to help build a positive relationship with food and their body for your kids is commenting on what they're eating. Making comments if maybe they chose to eat a granola bar with chocolate chips in it over an apple. Or commenting when they ask for the second serving of rice at a meal. Or commenting if they decide they don't want to eat that much at this meal. Whatever you're commenting and judging, again, coming from a place of love because we want them to be healthy, is actually causing them more feelings of guilt and shame, thinking there's something wrong with them. We really want to keep our feeding environment for our kids in neutral. We don't want them to feel like they're a good person because they picked an apple or a bad person because they picked chocolate chips. We just want them to feel good, right? We don't want them to have any emotions. So again, by leading, a health, by leading an example of all foods fit and you can choose what feels good in that moment and giving them that trust, I promise you there'll be times that they'll choose an apple over a granola bar. We just have to stop pressuring them to and commenting when they don't and making them feel negative emotions around food and their food choices. I want you to think of it this way. How would you feel if your partner commented on everything you ate and everything you did? You might have experienced that. Maybe you told your partner that you wanted to get healthy or diet and so you, you know, weren't going to eat ice cream and then you craved ice cream because you're human and you got one and then your partner was like, oh my god, I can't believe you're eating ice cream. You said you weren't going to. 
How does that make you feel? It probably didn't feel very good in that moment. Your kids aren't much different and they're almost more susceptible because you're their parent. You are someone they look up to and they want to do good for. And so when you are commenting negatively on what they're eating, they internalize it and it's hard on them. They don't want to fail you. They don't want to feel like they can't do anything right, but they don't understand how to make those choices because their brain isn't developed for it. And that's why, again, saying things are healthy or good or bad or unhealthy isn't helpful to them because they just want what their body is asking for. And sometimes that's the healthy food and sometimes it's not. And it is normal. That is what kids do. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed and learned a lot from these five tips. Let me know if you have any questions or if you would like more explanation, more videos on how to feed kids and how to foster that positive relationship with food. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button and share this video with other friends and parents that you think would love to learn this information as well. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram. Here's my handle as well as Shayna. Here's her handle. And I'd love to see videos or pictures of you implementing these new skills with your family and your children and how it's working for you. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye!